Hello, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Sam. And this is Progression in Progress. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Progression in Progress. How are we doing today, Sam? We're doing fantastic. How about you? Doing just wonderful. I am quite excited for today's interview. Um, we sit down with my good friend, Hiram Steven. Uh, I, I really, I mean, I don't know what kind of introduction to give Hiram. He's a great dude. Um, I met him down in San Diego. While I was serving my mission in San Diego. I met him down there and we, we had a great time together, interesting time together. And I learned a lot from him and, you know, we're doing this little mini series, right? About trying to figure out what Sam and I want to do for the rest of our lives. And Hiram had an incredibly detailed or maybe not detailed, but incredibly specific, I th- I'd say it's detailed, incredibly specific and detailed plan about what he wants to do for the rest of his life. And, you know, I learned about his plan six months ago, you know, six or more months ago. And then when I started this podcast, and then now what, 10, 12 weeks into it, now we're here doing this little mini series. I'm like, oh, dang, we got to have Hiram on. We got to have him explain his crazy plan um, for the whole world to hear. So that's the plan for today. Interview with Hiram Steven, talking about his crazy plan and a few other things. Um, kind of wrapping up, not wrapping up, wrapping up the interview portion of this mini series, talking about what Sam and I want to do with the rest of our lives. Um, and, you know, a part of that is interviewing other people to learn about how they figured out what they want to do for the rest of their lives. So I guess without me talking any more battling on, let's just jump right into the interview. You ready, Sam? Let's bring him on. Let's do it. All right, we got my man Hiram here. How you doing, Hiram? I'm doing pretty good. I'm happy to be out here, dude. I'm 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 glad we finally got you. I'm 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 looking forward to this. Yeah, I am too. It's it's been a long time coming, but I think it's gonna be pretty good. Yes, sir. Okay, well, I guess I know you pretty well. You know, we've been friends for a while. Well, not for a while, but I got to know you pretty well when we were hanging out. You know, so why don't you give a little bit of an introduction of yourself for those who don't know you? All right, uh, my name's Hiram Steven. I'm from uh, Papillion, Nebraska, a small town right outside of Omaha. And uh, I met Jonathan serving a mission in San Diego. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I'm just, um, I'm about to turn 22 and I'm out here at BYU, Idaho. Nice, nice. Okay, are the stereotypes true? Are there a lot of potatoes? There are a lot of potatoes. It's actually worse than Nebraska. There's not a lot to do out here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. That, that's rough. <laughs> well, Okay, so the reason why we wanted to bring you here into the po- into the podcast, because we've been doing like a little mini series within this podcast, you know, where Sam and I were talking about what we wanted to do for the rest of our lives, what we wanted to do school wise for me, and then what Sam wanted to do career wise. And we kind of had an idea of what we wanted to do, but we weren't 100% confident. So what we wanted to do was to interview other people who seem to know what they're doing and kind of get their perspective. So while we were uh, serving together in San Diego, you kind of explained to me what you want to do for your education and what your end goal is. And now I could try to explain it, but I'd probably butcher it and it'd probably be way more interesting if you just told it yourself. So kind of if you want to give us kind of a little overview or just lay out the plan that you've kind of created for yourself. Okay, yeah, my uh, my plan's been a long time uh, in in the process. I, I've thought about a lot of stuff, and in fact, when I ended high school, I had senior night uh, for choir, and they asked us to step forward and say what we're going to do with our lives. And I stepped forward. I said I was going to go on a mission, and then I said I was going to become a pro- professional Shakespearean actor. And that's not the case <laughs> anymore. That's not what I'm doing. And so um, there's there's a lot of there's been a lot of fluidity in what I want to do. And so right now, my plan is I'm an English major up here at BYU Idaho. Um, and then after I, after I finish this major with a minor in philosophy, I'm going to go down to BYU Provo and get a master's in religious education, which requires me to be a, a, like a teacher, like a religion teacher already to be in the program. And then afterwards, I want to go um, to a school called Creighton University. It is a really good law school. And I want to go there and get my, um, my de- a doctorate in constitutional law. And from there, I want to enter the judicial system. And uh, the end goal would be to be a Supreme Court justice. Dang. Well, hearing you tell it again a second time is just as impressive as the first time. Um, So, well, I guess first I want to ask, how many years of school are you going to have to do? Like how many, like how how many, are you going to be like 50 when you're done with school? Like what's going on? Pretty close to 50, honestly. I'm going to be, it's going to be four years here and then two years in BYU Provo and then probably four in... um, 
in Creighton. So altogether, that's that's about ten years. Ooh, that's rough. Is there anything that you can do to like you know? Uh, can you accelerate that anywhere? Or is that how you have to go about it? To uh, like, are there any like classes you can be taking at the same time or something that can also go towards like your religion uh, path or anything like that along the way? Well, I think because the the masters and the doctor that I'm going for are coming from schools that are fairly prestigious in those in those uh, in regards to those degrees, I don't think that there's a lot that can transfer. I think the closest I could do to speed up my time would be to not take time off and end school with a bunch of debt. Oh man! Well, good luck with that. I guess that's <laughs> that's pretty intense, bro. Well, no. I guess. That's that's impressive. That's a lot of schooling. Uh, I applaud you for being will, for being down to do that. Um, I'll probably do four years, you know, and then maybe like an MBA or something like that. And that's probably going to be too many years for me, dude. But um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you. You said you know right before or right as you ended high school, you had a completely different path, uh, completely a different path laid out for yourself. So what? What got you interested in the current path and when did you decide to switch? And like, did you craft this plan overnight? Like, did you sit it down and map it all out or did it evolve over time? That's a, that's a pretty loaded question. That's a pretty good question. So, um, all through high school, I really was not sure what I wanted to do. And actually I was, I was fairly sold on the idea of being a lawyer, but I was going into, I was thinking about going into something like business ethics or, um, something like aerospace, aerospace litigation. Cause there's, that's a, new field coming out with law. And I was pretty sold on those two ideas. And then I talked to my teacher and my English teacher. I love my English teacher. Her name is Miss Curtis. In high school? Yeah, in high school. Okay. Yeah. And and so uh, her name is Miss Curtis and I learned so much from her. And um, I, I read Hamlet with her, right? And Hamlet's my favorite piece of writing ever. And I think it's the most influential piece of writing to Western culture besides the Bible. It's it's up there. It's it's really cool. And when I read it, it just it just pricked me. And I, I was just like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And I think I could because I was a theater kid. I uh, I did a lot of plays and stuff like that, and I loved it. And so I was like, this is something I love. And I don't know if I'm going to end up doing this, but this is what I want to tell everyone that I want to do. And so I told everyone, but in my heart, I was still kind of like I wasn't sure. And then um, I went on a mission. And out there, I, I kind of served all over the place. I served some people who lived in the lowest conditions that I've ever seen in my life. Pretty pretty terrible their conditions and i was sitting there and looking at all that and i was thinking about the fact that um i don't know this is going to sound a little prideful but i I don't think it's coming from the same place in my heart that pride comes from i want people to know who i am because i did good in the world i want people to know my name for good and i was thinking about ways that i could do that and uh, i just didn't think that being a shakespearean actor would would be that and so I was considering other ways that I could affect the world in a beneficial manner. Then my mission president, actually, President Stubbs, told me um, because of some things that was going on that I was dealing with in my area. And I asked him about it and he told me, you'll be a pretty good lawyer. And so I thought about it and I was thinking about being a lawyer and I didn't think that lawyer was enough. And so actually it was kind of overnight. I woke up one day and I was walking and somebody asked me what I was going to do with my life. And I said, I'm going to be a Supreme Court justice. And they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And it just felt right. And so I don't know if I'm going to end up doing that, but that's the direction I want to go. Because I, I truly do feel like um, if I remain stable in my, uh, if I remain philosophical in the way I think and scientific, I think that I really could benefit the world and at least our nation um, by being a Supreme Court justice. Kind of following on that, uh, like philosophy and things like that, I know to be a, or I'd imagine to be a justice, you have to have a pretty good like moral compass and good set of morals as long as, uh, as well as knowing the actual law and uh, how to apply that. How do you think that uh, throughout your schooling, uh, you know, learning about philosophy as well as just in your personal life, how do you think your, your morals are and how those like will affect um, being a judge or you know, just kind of, kind of that whole process there. Oh man. So yeah, that is is an interesting question because, uh, so much about the judicial system, it can't be biased. You can't go from your own biases and often you can't go from your own moral compass as a Supreme court justice. Your job is to interpret the constitution and that's it. It's not to necessarily say what's right or wrong. For example, uh, several years ago when, 
um, there was a huge gay rights movement and the, and the, the Congress had a, had a huge meeting in the Supreme Court and they decided to make um, homosexual relationships legal. The actual debate was not one of the moral validity of the action, but rather the definition of marriage, because the only thing discussed in the Constitution and uh, the laws surrounding it is marriage, not necessarily gay rights. And so um, you can see morals and, and items have to fit inside there. And so I have to be able to think um, outside of my own morals. However, that being said, uh, currently there's only, I believe, two, maybe, maybe just one, uh, Supreme Court justice who does not subscribe to the idea of positivism, which is to believe that all of our rights are given to us by the government. And in my, my mind, that's not really how the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence was framed. And so that seems wrong to me. And so believing in the divine providence uh, or God, I think something that could really set apart and give me maybe a, a more purist perspective on what the Constitution is supposed to be. Does that make sense? No, that makes a lot of sense. That's, it's almost like your moral compass has to be, you know, you can have your own morals, you can have your own opinions, but rather the most important part is having a moral compass to uphold the constitution not, and not to be biased. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I think that's exactly spot on. Dang, that's interesting. Well, I guess, you know, you, in telling your story about how you decided you want to do this, I think one that's cool because we've talked to a lot of people who kind of have figured out um, what they wanted to do over time, you know, either they had an idea and they kind of went with it and they realized it worked out or, you know, we just interviewed someone last week who it took him like 10 years to figure out what he wanted to do. And then, you know, so we've kind of, I, I like getting that contrast, you know, of you where you're like, okay, this is what I wanted to do. And then overnight you kind of changed it. And I'm sure, you know, it wasn't literally like, you know, the moment you talked to Stubbs about being a lawyer and then said you were Supreme Court justice overnight type of thing, but you know, a pretty quick process. I think that's kind of cool to see the contrast there. And I guess just as a follow-up question to that, how confident are you in your plan? You know, you are, are you, you at the end, you kind of talked about maybe wanting to, or not 100% sure that's what will end up happening, but like how confident that you're going to be able to, how confident are you that you're going to be able to achieve what you are setting out to do? There's, there's a saying that I like that says, um, if you can go to a restaurant, a sit down restaurant and go to the movie theater by yourself, then you can do anything. And I think that's kind of funny, but I, th I think there's some power to that. There's a power in, in solitary work, right? And I believe that I have the work ethic to do it. I believe that if it were up to me entirely, um, then I could do it. However, my, my comment earlier was kind of recognizing the fact that my life is not necessarily dictated by myself. As I get married, as I start a family, I'm, I'm going to take those things into consideration. And so if I end up just being a college teacher, I'll be satisfied with that knowing that um, I did everything. But it's definitely not going to, I don't think that it's going to be the case where I, I don't put enough work in or I don't quite do it because I will. I, I totally believe that I, that I have the work ethic and uh, that's the most important part. But I think I can build the intelligence to do it too. Well, that's, that's just some inspiring self-confidence. Yeah, I, like I love that. that conviction. I think that's something Sam and I need to hear because me and Sam are a little more passive when it comes to talking about stuff like this. We like mm -hmm. having conversations instead of kind of, you know, telling people what to do or, you know, coming out with that type of conviction. But I'm glad you can come in here and lay down the law, literally. So <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. I guess one, I got two more questions uh, before we wrap up. One is... This is something I've been thinking about lately. You know, I've been on that workout grind and I've been trying to convince myself that, you know, you got to like love the pain. You got to love, you know, when you start feeling like you can't do anymore, like that's like, you got to love that feeling. And I've been trying to convince myself of that. But at the same time, you know, I'm not working out. And in reality, I'm not working out just because I love the pain. It's because, you know, I want to be fit, right? I want to be working towards being fit. So I guess with your whole process your whole journey that you've just laid out, you know, there's a specific end goal that at this moment is what you have decided. And my question to you would be, are you in love with the journey or are you obsessed with the end goal? Uh, I think it's definitely the journey, definitely the journey. And I think, well, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about what, what gives life meaning, you know, what, what gives value to human life and whatever. And I've been think I've been considering with, with my roommate, we've been talking a lot about this, what, what is it that gives value to life? And we've identified that a lot of people identify pain as what gives value to life. They'll say, oh, he was, suff he was suffering too much. 
like if you think about dogs, they'll say they were suffering too much, so we had to put them down. What that's saying is that pain, pain or pleasure is giving meaning to that being's life. And I don't think that's the case with humans. I think what we are, uh, I don't think that's us. I think what gives meaning to life is um, outside of what we can comprehend. So for me, it's a little bit of both. I love the journey. If I could be a professional student, I probably would. Uh, I love learning. I love going to classes. I love uh, getting stretched in that way. Um, the similar in, in a similar fashion, I, I love playing soccer. I love working out. I love uh, feeling that pain, but it's not because I enjoy the pain. It's because I enjoy what it's doing to me, or what, what, I, what I know it's doing to me, where I know it's leading me. And so it's kind of a mixture of both. It, does, it, does that make sense at all? Yeah, that does. That makes a, a lot of sense. Okay, real quick. I got one quick question for you. Um, you don't have to go super in depth into it. And then I want to get your closing thoughts. But on this podcast, okay, something you told me while we were on our mission together in San Diego, you told me about nations and great stories. Do you remember that? Do you remember telling me about that? Nations and great stories? Yes. I feel like I, it's going to be embarrassing if this wasn't you who told it to me. But you told me about how nations have their own great story. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. So do you want to give me like maybe like a two minute spiel about that? Because we've actually talked about that a few times on the podcast because that was something that stuck with me and made a lot of sense to me. And I want to hear, you know, I want to hear you tell it to me again. And so everyone else can kind of get it from the source or where I learned it from. Okay. Yeah. So basically every nation, so no nation has survived over 700 years without creating art. And after that 700 years period, generally speaking, a literary work, and sometimes it takes thousands of years in the case of France or Germany, uh, for a country to produce what they would call their hero, um, for, for instance. And those heroes have certain traits. In German uh, literature, you'll find that what, what their hero always seeks is uh, depth of knowledge, like uh, it, eternal and uh, all-powerful knowledge. And if you look at German culture, that's what they revolve around. And likewise, in, in uh, England, there's they have to, it's Beowulf, so they have to come from royalty. They have to be overcome a challenge. Think Harry Potter, right? But for us, it's Huckleberry Finn. It's the underdog story. That's why we love a good underdog story. It's someone who came from nothing and came back not only with riches, but a way to benefit society in a whole. That's really cool. Well, I appreciate hearing that from the from the source. I mean, not that you're writing these great stories, but rather just hearing, <laughs> you know, because it will help me to hear it again. And kind of re reorientate myself with that. I don't know. I feel like that's a great story you told me that that I appreciated. So awesome. Well, I think you've dropped some knowledge on us. I've really appreciated you coming here into the podcast. So we always before we end things, we love to ask people if they have any closing thoughts or advice that they want to give. Yeah, I, I do have some advice. Um, it's actually a quote by Alice Dumbledore that I really really okay. like. Uh, so he said, it matters not what someone is born, but what they grow to be. I think a lot of times we allow our surroundings to dictate who we are or situations to dictate who we are, but that's not necessarily the case. I believe in God. And that means I believe that uh, my roots aren't from this, this earth and I have potential to go beyond this earth. And because of that, it gives me strength to realize that um, there's so much to life that I miss out on if I let myself be dictated and defined by what happens to me instead of what I do. And uh, I think if I could let anyone hear that, right, like if there's something that I could let everyone hear right now, that'd be it. I think too much of the world is surrounded in hate and hate is reciprocal because what, what people perceive happening to them and that's who they are is how they perceive it. And that's not the case. Um, you're so much more than that. You get to choose. You get to choose and you get to overcome. And that's that's the beauty of life. Dude, that's we talk about that so much here on the show on progression and progress, you know, take control of what you can and you know, you're dealt a deck of cards, you know, your life is a deck of cards and you you can't dictate what kind of cards you have. So what you have to do is make the most of them. So that's that's cool. That that's your that's your closing closing advice, your closing statement. I think that's I mean that's something my dad's taught me. That's probably the one of the most important thing my dad's taught me. Uh, I mean maybe not the most important things, but one of the most important things that he's taught me. You know, and I I've seen it work in my life. You know, I've I've faced physical challenges in my life. Um, probably the best thing my parents have done for me is they have encouraged me to not let that control me. They've encouraged me to. They, well, they didn't even have to encourage me to do it because they just treated, they didn't, they treated me in a way that it didn't define me. 
if that makes sense. And I, I've seen that work so much in my own life. And I lately have been thinking about that. And especially as we've been talking about it on the podcast, I've been thinking about it and I can see the areas of my life where I've decided to take control. You know, they're significantly better than the areas of my life where I feel like I'm being influenced by things that I can't control. That's a really cool way to think of it. I, I, I love that concept a whole lot about ownership and uh, accountability partnered with uh, the ability to choose. I love that. Yeah. What was that quote one more time from Dumbledore? Uh, it matters not what someone is born, but what they grow to be. Dude, perfect. That's literally progression of progress. That quote captures what we try to express here on that show. I love it. Well, Hiram, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Um, we're probably going to have to have you back another time because I feel like we didn't have enough time to to hear all that you have to say. So thank you so much. Yeah, I really loved it. Thanks for Thanks for having me. Well, I guess just to wrap things up, well, first, we really appreciate Hiram coming to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Hiram. Thank no, you. We really, yeah, we appreciate it. But just to wrap things up, Sam and I are back to the post-interview conversation. I think we missed it last week because of scheduling not lining up, but we're back on it, back on that grind. So just real quick, Sam and I wanted to talk about our takeaways from that episode. And I wanted to start things off, start the discussion off with highlighting or pointing out the contrast between Hiram's story and the story of other people or the story and experiences of other people we've interviewed. So for example, when we talked about my cousin, Ethan, or talked with my cousin, Ethan, he talked about um, how he decided on a computer science major. And it was kind of a gradual, gradual process of being interested in something when we were kids or not kids, when we were teenagers, um, interested in something. And then that became his hobby. And then he took a class in high school and then he took a class in college and then decided, you know, um, that was going to be his major. And it was based off of a bunch of little small, simple things combined to, you know, become a something major, I guess, emphasis on major because college, but, <laughs> but, and then we also talked to Adam where his was a little combination of both, where it was a lot of small things over time that led to kind of a, moment as small things over time that led to a moment of him being like, Oh shoot, this is what I need to do. This is what I want to do. This is something I think I could do. So it was kind of a combination for Adam, you know, cause he, he, it took him 10 years to figure it out. But then when he did figure it out, when he did figure it out, he figured it out, you know? Yeah. And then with Hiram, it's almost like the complete opposite. It seems like, I mean, there's still elements of, you know, Ethan's story and still elements of Adam's story in Hiram's story, but it's a little more to the opposite end of the extreme where it almost sounded like he woke up one day and was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Literally is kind of what he said. Um, so I guess that's good to see multiple perspectives on the small and simple narrative. Cause you know, that's what Sam and I have kind of been talking about. Small and simple things lead to you figuring out what you want to do. It's kind of been a takeaway for me, but listening to Hiram's story, I think, and I still, I still do believe that probably for most people, the small and simple things are going to, what's going to, is what, that is what's going to constitute or make up or lead to their decision to choose what they want to do for the rest of their life. But I still think it's good to hear the opposite point of view, the complete opposite point of view, because I, I mean, it, it happened to Hiram. So I'm guess I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen to other people. So I guess it's good to just see the other point of view, the other perspective. So what do you think about him, Sam, just waking up one night and not waking up one night, but waking up one morning and just being like, okay, boom, just told someone I'm going to be a Supreme Court justice. And now that's his plan. I mean, I think that's pretty awesome. Like, I'm sure there are people that, you know, just come to this earth and they have something that they're like almost called to do or just, you know, just kind of have always had an inclination to do or just kind of, you know, just have that that path in their mind and, and the who, confidence who to do it. Yeah. And the confidence, man, to just go out there and, and get it done and, you know, set out to, to do that. So I, I do think it's probably rare that that occurs. And I think most people probably are, you know, just kind of have to figure it out as they go. Um, but man, I really wish I could have that just one day wake up and just, okay, this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And then just hit the ground running. That would be nice. Um, maybe I guess we're a little envious of Hiram, but, bit. <laughs> but I think, but just, it, it's good to see the opposite, opposite perspective, but I guess it's good to keep it in mind that it's probably not going to be like that for most people. It's probably going to be 
a combination between Ethan and Adam's story, you know, yeah. it's going to be more like that. So I feel like the, now that he knows what he wants to do, uh, he still has that, uh, that same kind of passion for it. Uh, like the, uh, the other people we've interviewed had. So I still think once you do find out, uh, what that is, you're going to do, uh, then you'll probably kind of feel or act the kind of the same way. Like I felt the same vibe kind of from all of them in that regard. Yeah. So once you get there, you know, I guess it matters not, it matters not how you get there, but you know, just uh, you eventually get there. Exactly. Which is kind of leads into the quote that he shared that I really liked. And I'm probably going to butcher it because I don't remember it exactly, but that quote he shared, and I don't want to really go too in depth in this because I feel like we've talked about this topic a million times, but I think it's just, uh, I really liked it. And I guess that's why we talk about it all the time, but I really liked it. So I just wanted to highlight it real quickly. It says it matter that that Dumbledore quote, right? The, it matters not what you were born or how you were born or what you were born with or what you're, I, I'm butchering it so bad, but it matters not who you were born. It matters who you will be or something like that to that along those lines. Sorry to all the Harry Potter fans and sorry to hire him for butchering that. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we need to have a super in length discussion about that because I feel like we've beaten that horse beating that bush is it wait is it beat a bush beat the horse beat, which one is it what's the saying uh we i guess we beat a dead horse about it yeah because beat, beat, beat around a bush is oh there it is beat around a bush we're beating around a dead bush horse <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah so so we've already so we don't need to beat a dead horse here but sam what i, I guess i wanted to ask you sam what do you think about his comments on solitary work that, you know, he shared another quote. I don't know if that was from someone specific or just a saying he'd heard, but he, something to the effect of, if you can go to a restaurant by yourself and if you can go to the movie theater by yourself, you can do anything. What do you think about that? Hmm. I mean, I think there's some truth to that. I think uh, even for me, I kind of have like under, definitely like underplayed or I don't know what the word is or under... Valued? undervalued something like that I, I just thought i could do less than i can actually do and like when really like you especially now with all the information and everything that we have out there like if you want to do something someone else has probably done something similar and there's you know there's a way to to do that and i think yeah if you can go and you know just I don't know. There's so much, so many resources, so many paths, so many opportunities out there that I just think that if if there's something you want to do, you can you can probably do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's that's another another thing that I'm grateful for my dad, or that that he's taught me, is that and continues to teach me is that if you can do anything you set your mind to, and yeah. I guess that's along the same lines here with the solitary work but i like the interesting i think okay i swear i'm gonna butcher two words two phrases in this in this outro here but uh, it's an interesting dichotomy you know different interesting contracts juxtaposition man i i gotta read a dictionary or something dude but <laughs> interesting juxtaposition of you know the internet the age of the internet as the internet internet becomes more and more prevalent we're more connected but at the same time solitary work has never been so powerful I think, because exactly what you said, Sam, even though we're so connected now and you think, you know, that it would be correlated, the trends, you know, more connectivity means you need to be more, con or it's more important ever to, or like the only way to do things is to be connected, which I think is in some aspect true. But at the same time, the very same time, you, there's so much information out there. There's so many opportunities. I think you explained it perfectly, Sam, so many opportunities, so many paths, so many careers, so many whatever, and that, that you could learn with all the knowledge that's on the, the internet, with all yeah. the knowledge that's online. So I think they're really, especially in this day and age, there is power in solitary work. Like for example, come on, like, okay, this is this has been a little frustrating. All my classes so far have been pretty dang good online. You know, I'm doing a mix of online and person, but it's mostly online. Mm -hmm. All of them have been pretty dang good, um, except for this one class that I'm taking. I won't give too many details away about it, but the teacher so far has just posted like half of the, half of the, content that we consume you know one half is things that i think he's written or the textbook's written or someone 
has written and the other half are literally just YouTube videos he posts. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, like I, I, I don't want to complain about like, why am I paying for this? Cause I can see, I can <laughs> still see the value being added by taking this course. But at the same time, it's like, okay, well, all this is just for free on YouTube. You know, half of this course is free on YouTube. Like what's going on here, you know? And I, 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 I guess I bring that up not to complain, but rather to emphasize the power or the opportunity to work solitary. No, yeah. that doesn't work. Just the power of solitary work there. Yeah. And I think it's kind of interesting what you were saying, how, you know, it's both the most connected and like also most solitary time. And like even just saying like, okay, you can just go onto YouTube and look up anything, but you know, that was made by someone else. So in a way we're all kind of like helping each other or like there is that kind of connection there. You know, even if you are yeah. just, you know, watching some kind of tutorial. So you're never yeah. really doing anything alone in a way. But, no. Like, yeah, can use other people's experiences and, um, yeah, can. Well, no, it's, it's interesting. For your own drive. Just one final comment. I'm taking an econ's cla econ class right now and I really love it because I'm an old man. Um, and it, it's, we're all just trading information. We all see how we can benefit ourselves by giving information away. Mm -hmm. right but by giving that information away we better all of society right. so i don't know that's just some random comment but i think i think that's pretty cool yeah definitely dang all right i guess that we, that concludes you know our post conversation interview i'm a big fan of these it kind of helps me finalize what i've learned and just put it out there and kind of internalize it by externalizing it i guess so once again thank you so much for listening to another episode of progression and progress as always uh, new episodes every single Monday. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Talk Progression. What else, Sam? What else do they need to do? Uh, be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you're notified as soon as it goes live on Mondays. Um, yep. And be sure to leave a comment or a review on our podcast sites, uh, wherever you listen, if it supports that. And be sure to uh, give us a high rating. It really helps us out. And also be sure to share with a friend or someone else that you think would enjoy these uh, these episodes. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. And also just a little teaser here. Um, coming soon, video to Progression Progress. Um, it might take us a few weeks to get it all up and running and going, but it is coming and I'm very excited about it. And, you know, we'll probably upload the full video version to YouTube, but the audio version will remain unchanged. But where I think what's most exciting about it is that our Instagram content will be able to take it to the next level. So make sure you're following us at Talk Progression on Instagram. All right. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.